We're good. We're rested. We're ready to absorb new material. So we're faced with a pretty significant challenge. Not now, not really. It's cold and windy outside, but imagine exercising in the heat. Think about going into a sauna and trying to ride a bike. That's a pretty significant challenge. And so how do we as free living organisms respond? We've seen how the muscle responds, the brain responds, some of the physiological changes that occur. But what is our response to those changes? What do we do when we're faced with this stressful situation? I don't know about you, but I slow down, right? We probably all pace ourselves. And so pace selection is a behavioral strategy for dealing with this hyperthermia. And it's really difficult to define pace selection. And it's one of the things that professional athletes war with. But it's, it's a really cool topic. And what I mean by pace selection, another word for it is called telio anticipation, which doesn't really describe the phenomenon as well. But essentially, your body, the, the central command center in your brain that says, oh, I'm going to start exercising. I feel like I should go for a run, and I'm going to start jogging down the block and then pick up the pace and keep going. Whatever it is that tells you to start exercising that initiates it in the first place is always integrating environmental information, physiological information to figure out, can I do this? Am I running too fast? Can I run faster? That's always my problem. I, I hate running. I'm a cyclist, but I'm not a runner. And it's because I feel like I'm going too slow. I go out for a run and I'm jogging and it just, the scenery doesn't change very much. And so I try to go faster. And then all the signals going back to that command center just start red flag, buzzers, sirens, and I fatigue way too early. I don't pace myself nearly as much as I should. So for that reason, I never, I never run. Love cycling because I get a bit more variety. It seems like I can go faster and maybe it's not as stressful. But that center is always integrating this information and it uses it, unbeknownst to us, to create a plan to complete the task. So I know that I'm going too fast, and then I slow down, and I'm far enough from home that I've got to turn around and come back, and I run slower on the way home, but I run slower so that I can get home. The plan exists. I don't know what it is, but I have it in my head somewhere to complete the task as efficiently as I can without fatiguing. And this idea is really intriguing. How does it create a plan to complete a task efficiently? How does it ever imagine what the situation will be like an hour down the road? In this temperature, with this wind, if I can project half an hour into the future, an hour into the future, how do I know what it will feel like to have exercised for that long? How do I know what pace to set myself at to reach that point in time? This is a response that's arguably trainable because you don't have a good idea of how this works. And like me, if you're unprepared, you overdo it the first few times. Maybe you learn how to pace yourself better as you train. This idea of teleo anticipation is something that we've all observed. You've all felt this. And I'm showing you data from one of my doctoral studies, which um, was meant to mimic ice hockey. I did a lot of work on um, dehydration with ice hockey players, looking at metabolism and some cognitive variables to see, okay, well, does, does being dehydrated make you, um, make you a worse hockey player? Does it um, compromise performance? So this is not actual hockey. This is um, done on a, a bike, a cycle ergometer, and these are repeated sprints, and they're meant to be like ice hockey shifts. 
Then you cycle really fast, and then you slow down, and you spin up, and you slow down. And if they followed the recipe that I had set for them, they would do this much work. Every one of these bars is a measure of work that was done in a sprint. There's three periods, there's ten shifts per period. If they had done it perfectly, they'd be up here at this dash line. No one did it perfectly, that's fine. As far as pacing is concerned, all I want you to focus on is the last pair of bars. These, these values, at least in this open bar group, is as high as some of the first bars at the beginning of the two-hour protocol. How is that possible? They started really strong, and then each shift, it got harder. They did less and less work. Second period, less and less work. Third period, less and less work. But the last sprint, they knew they were done. They didn't have any other work to do. And so they threw caution to the wind. They didn't need to pace themselves. And in the, the well-hydrated group, they did as well, they did as much work as they did at the start of the entire protocol. This is after two hours of really intense exercise. So this exemplifies teleo anticipation. This exemplifies pacing. They weren't sure really what to expect from the protocol, and then when it was done, they're like, oh, I've got more left in the tank. We've all experienced this. You're on the home stretch. You're back from your run. You're two blocks away. You run faster to get home. Why can't we keep this up the entire time? Why is pace regulated the way it is? <clears throat> Why does pace go down? Pace goes down to allow us to complete the task efficiently with the least stress possible. One way to observe and test this is to do an exercise task not at a fixed intensity, like a percent of VO2 max or at a set workload that you would normally do, but here at a fixed RPE, a fixed rating of perceived exertion. So we don't want the exercise to be of the same cost. We want it to feel the same for all people. The comparison we're making in this case is exercise in a cool environment, a normal or a warm environment. And you can see the, the temperatures listed here. And what we're looking at initially is the rate of heat storage. So this is, if you took all the factors in the heat balance equation, and you calculated S, that's what we're looking at. This is the rate of heat storage. This is metabolism, work, conduction, convection, evaporation, all boiled down into one number. And we're plotting that number here over 30 minutes. So heat flow, heat balance. Initially, it's as you would expect. In the cold group, there's a negative heat balance. Heat is flowing out of the body. Really cold environment, you are warmer, you're giving off heat to the environment. In a neutral environment, a little bit of, of heat gain from the, the work that you're doing, metabolism is really large as you're exercising, and then in the heat, there's the added load of the environment increasing heat storage. I'd almost expect this separation to persist throughout the half hour of exercise, right? The environment dictates, it's a, it's a physical um, factor that dictates what heat balance should be. But as soon as we get to 20 minutes, heat storage is normalized in all groups. And it stays normal. There's no difference between groups to the end of the 30 minute bout. So 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes. Keep in mind, this is at the same fixed rating of perceived exertion. The exercise feels of a similar intensity or of a similar stress. 
we are exercising according to our pacing strategy. Think about it that way. So what do we do to exercise to achieve this normalization? So without looking at um, too many details, this is how workload changes to accomplish this change in heat balance or in heat flow. Initially, we have a given workload, and at 10 minutes, we are developing our pacing strategy. We're learning what it's like to work in that environment at this pace. Pace, by the way, is 75% uh, of VO2 max, so fairly moderate to high intensity. What does it feel like to work in this environment at this pace? The difference with this study is we're not keeping the individual at 75% of VO2 max. We allow them to slow down if they need to, and we encourage it to maintain the same RPE. After 10 minutes, and we've developed our idea of what the pace is like, we see the separation. All of a sudden, the hot condition slows way down. Hot condition slows way down. Metabolism has a lesser impact on heat flow. It decreases heat storage, allowing it to normalize and meet up with the other two groups. That pacing stays lower throughout the 30 minutes. So we've developed this strategy where because of the added stress of the environment, we're minimizing the stress of exercise. We slow down so we can accomplish this task efficiently in the time allotted. So we're not sure why this happens, what the thing is that makes us make this switch. Maybe it's heat storage, maybe it's the starting temperature, maybe it's sweat rate, I'm not sure, but this is a pretty, pretty cool finding. This is pacing to achieve the goal that we set out to do. And there are a number of different things that could result in this pacing strategy. We've narrowed them down to a few likely candidates. Core temperature, probably first on all of your lists. Core temperature or the rate of change in core temperature is probably a really good uh, dictator of pace. Skin temperature would, would probably modify pace or might be used to calculate flow between the internal temperature and then the, the skin proper. Core and skin temperatures are very likely to be involved in dictating pace. It's very possible not in that example that I just showed you, but long term that fuel status or energy status plays a role. If you give individuals enough time and you do a time to exhaustion type test, glycogen availability in the muscle can predict when you're going to fatigue. If it gets really, really low, that's a sign of fatigue. In 30 minutes, that's not a question. There's no way that you're going to use all the glycogen in the muscle in 30 minutes. So in that last example, it's not a major player, but long term, this may ramp up its contribution to dictating pace. <coughs> Excuse me. Similarly, O2 saturation, the amount of oxygen the muscle can take up or extraction by the muscle, or what I'm going to call psychological factors which is really a catch-all term for things we don't understand about our perception of the exercise, how we feel about the exercise, how we feel on any given day. Are we stressed? Have we been relaxed, sleeping well? Um, do we just get in a fight with our partner? Psychological factors are things that we don't fully understand. Are you stressed about midterms? Who knows? There's probably some other elements on here. There's no cardiovascular elements on this list. Heart rate uh, increasing might help dictate pace as well. There's a, there's a lot of things that could inform pace. 
And we don't actually know <coughs> what the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> oh. <clears throat> I don't think we can narrow it down to one. And I don't think there is one. I think it's probably a combination of most or all of these factors that dictates fatigue or dictates pace. I want to explore the psychological factors a bit because it's pretty interesting. How you feel about exercise, or maybe how you feel in general, can impact exercise performance. If I told you that, would you believe that? Okay, some general assent. Why? Why would you think that's true? If you're in a positive, happy mood one day versus an angry, frustrated mood another day, you'd think that performance would be better in the happy situation? Would there be any effect? You can almost argue that if you're frustrated, you're got more adrenaline pumping, maybe exercise is better in that situation. You can go either way. Your perception does influence performance. And this is a, a really unique study at the time. This was 2016 when I put this together. This was in press. This is a fairly new study. Looking at the role of motivational self-talk on exercise performance. So motivational self-talk is, it's not really like meditation or behavioral therapy. It's more of like group support. I kind of think of it like AA, where you get together and you can, you can talk about issues or problems and everyone's there in a supportive environment. Motivational self-talk over two weeks. I think there were meetings every day in the motivational self-talk group. The control group just went about their business for two weeks, no meetings, no instruction, status quo. Before and after those two weeks, these groups undertook a time to exhaustion test. And you can see in the control group, like you would expect, if you live your life for two weeks and don't do anything, your performance probably shouldn't change. No change in fitness, no change in diet, ideally pretty similar performance overall. Unless there's some other major change going on in the lives of these individuals, two weeks of group therapy as motivational self-talk improved time to exhaustion at seven or at 80 percent of VO2 max. Does that seem odd? That's, to me, that's unexpected. I have no idea how to explain that. How motivational self-talk, telling yourself that you can do the exercise, you're, you're good enough, you're fast enough, how that would impact performance. Yet we see this increase in time to exhaustion at 80% of peak power output. Another way to look at it is... Um, in sort of the long form, the time to exhaustion values here are just total time to exhaustion. And they are this third column in the graphs here. So there's temperature, there's heart rate, and we have pre and post control, pre and post motivational self-talk. This X2 column is the time trial to exhaustion. So on a given day, when they came in to do the exercise, they did 30 minutes of warm-up, they took a break for 30 minutes, they did their time trial, and then they did 30 minutes of um, cool-down at the end. And these breaks in between were where they administered some cognitive tests, reaction time tests, to try to explain what motivational self-talk might be doing, or what changes might occur that could explain any differences in performance. So what I think is pretty interesting, throughout the warm-up, the break, the time trial, and the cool-down, heart rate response, not different. Identical heart rate response before and after, whether you're in control or the motivational self-talk group. That's kind of what I would expect. 
But core temperature shows a bit more variation. Over here on the far right hand side of the graph is where I want you to look. There's no real difference initially during the time trial, but at the end of the time trial and then into recovery, post MST, post motivational self-talk, core temperature is higher. They allow a higher core temperature in order to complete the work. They allow perhaps a higher power output, a higher workload in order to complete the work. And I don't know how motivational self-talk makes that happen, how being positive with your own perspective or your own situation allows you to venture further into heat stress or if that's a good thing. But the end result is that performance goes up. Heart rate response is the same, but we allow a higher core temperature. I'm really not sure how to explain that. There's also some small differences in some of the cognitive tasks that they did. So this is a, a maze learning task. And I forget the specifics of this one, but I think it's like um, the trails test where you have uh, letters and numbers on a page randomly and you have to trace 1A, 2B, 3C, and then the time that it takes you to do that um, indicates your ability to process that, that task. So a lower time frame is better. And we see... What am I... Wait, what am I trying to show you? Yeah, okay. And we see a greater decrease in that task in the motivational self-talk group. So... There's less inhibition, perhaps, because of the motivational self-talk intervention. There's less inhibition on their ability to perform this task. There's less inhibition on their ability to perform exercise, which results in a greater improvement in exercise performance somehow. Not only does the time improve, but the number of errors goes down, too. This isn't training. It's not heat acclimation. It's not a new diet. Maybe they, they decided motivational self-talk helped them make better life choices. Maybe they're not drinking as much on the weekends. Who knows? Ideally, everything else is the same. This is just positive perception, an accepting, supportive group therapy session done once a day for two weeks. Your guess is as good as mine. <clears throat> that response really begs the question of, okay, is that increase in core temperature good? Yes, we see an increase in performance, but without training, we'd still expect those individuals to have that same critical core temperature. Remember we saw that way back at the start, there's always a critical temperature where people tend to fatigue. It's higher in trained athletes. It's lower in the unfit individuals. They're pushing themselves further. Is that a good thing? Performance goes up, but do you want to get too hot? And this is a picture of Corey Stringer that we mentioned at the start of this chapter, the fellow that uh, played for the Minnesota Vikings that in training camp suffered a heat stroke, was rushed to hospital, body couldn't be cooled, and he died as a result of pushing himself too hard during two-a-day training in the heat. And this is the fellow for which Doug Casson named his institute, the Corey Stringer Institute at UConn, 100% preventable situation. But when you're caught up in the warrior mentality of two-a-day football training, and you have the ability to ignore the warning signs like a professional athlete might, you can get yourself into some dangerous situations. So that critical core temperature goes up 
in trained individuals. They have some things that allow them to thermoregulate better, and they can also resist higher temperatures. Mentally, they can resist greater stress. They can resist higher temperatures. Their RPE tends to be lower for a given core temperature. They can choose a faster pace for a given core temperature. It's all part of competing. And like we saw in that last study, you can override what would normally be your limit. The question is, is that a good thing? The question is, is it universal? Maybe Corey Stringer was just a really driven individual. Maybe somehow that motivational self-talk generated some kind of drive in the individuals in that last study. I personally don't think that I'm ever capable of pushing myself that hard. Maybe that's why I always plateau and don't succeed in my exercise programs. I don't push hard enough. I don't know. Maybe it's individual. But all of this really boils down to the really interesting conclusion <coughs> that as you train, you gain these tools that allow you to push core temperature higher, but the ability to push core temperature higher is learned. And the ability to pace yourself in the face of this environmental stress is learned. So if I were to stick with running, I wouldn't overdo it in the first 10, 15 minutes if I practiced long enough. I'd learn to pace myself. I'd learn not to reach that critical temperature or that critical threshold too quickly. If I did that hockey study with the same subjects a few times, they might learn to pace themselves so they didn't have so much left in the tank at the end. The ability to pace yourself and anticipate um, that influence of hyperthermia is learned. And we don't know how it's learned. We don't know how to learn it quicker. We don't know if learning it is a good thing even, if it helps you to push past that critical temperature. But it is something that you can learn. Any questions about that?